Yeah. Yeah. And it's go time, so it's actually two fifty nine. Three o'clock. Why are my phone and my computer not agreeing on what time it is? I'm gonna have to investigate that later. Um, it is. Uh oh. Okay. It is. <laughs> Or 6 right. p.m. if you're on the East Coast. I'm 6 p.m., yeah. All right. 5 p.m. if you're in Texas. <laughs> We're going to do a, a mental here. countdown, and I'm going to start, okay? Starting at 5. 4, 3, 2. <clears throat> hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Benjamin Muller. I'm a paleontologist, and today I'm unveiling um, something that has been a little over two years in the making, and I've got some friends with me on uh, stream. Say hello, friends. Hello. Hello. You guys were supposed to say hello, friends. Only one of you got it right. Yay. I can't follow instructions. <laughs> no. Said the PhD student at Yale. So I'm. <laughs> so today we're looking at um, a project that. Uh, oh well, let's let's start at the beginning. So I was just talking a little bit earlier on the stream about um, my college education. I got my bachelor's degree from the University of Arizona. I'm still based in Tucson. Um, back in December of 2021, and after about a year of trying to find work doing what I'm good at, which is science outreach and things like that, and just not making much headway, I decided to start my own um, educational project on uh, hosted on patreon.com slash PT Paleo. That stands for the Parent Teacher Guide to Paleontology. Basically, I make um, natural history educational materials geared towards like adult and mature student audiences. Um, there's a lot of stuff out there. There's, there's many, many resources for, um, you know, uh, like when kids get really into fossils and dinosaurs and stuff, there's plenty of places to go. But there's this, and then you've got the academic sources that are like way esoteric and like really hard to break into. And there's not a whole lot that's like in the middle. And so that's kind of what I like uh, creating stuff for. So I was writing, um, and I've continued to write research articles, uh, do Q&As. Um, that involves a lot of photography, a lot of video editing, uh, photo editing. I do field work, uh, so I'm actively digging fossils uh, during the spring and summer and sometimes into the fall as well. I've been doing that since 2007 when I was an eight-year-old. I'm 25 now. So um, I've just got a lot of experience that I was trying to find a home, a platform, basically, to, to put all of this on. And so PT Paleo started as a way for me to just keep refining my research skills, um, make a little bit of money here and there. But um, it was never, you know, the articles and the videos and stuff, that was never the end goal. There was always something I was trying to build towards, but I didn't express at the time what I hoped that would be because I was not at all confident that I could pull it off. Um, I, again, I'm a paleontologist and not a software developer. And so I didn't necessarily want to say, yeah, and I'd love to make a virtual museum that kind of displays all of this work at the end of the day. Um, <laughs> but that was, that was always the goal. And so I put in about a year um, doing that. And about a year ago, sorry, I'm just noticing a, a playback issue on my end on the stream. I think it's fine. I think it's just my internet taking a hiccup. Um, I will answer your question in the chat in just one second. But um, yeah, so about a year ago, I decided it was about time to take the plunge and try to figure out some kind of software development um, uh, uh, avenue to try to build basically a virtual museum. And there were a lot of compounding factors to that that I'll get to, but I settled on Unreal Engine. Um, I've been having I think if we go ahead and look around the lobby a little bit, I think it's worked out pretty well. I really, really like the way that this all looks, um, and I'll kind of explain what sort of stuff we're looking at here. Um, but I've been I've been developing this in Unreal Engine since about November of last year, and trying to get it to the point that it looked nice enough and it was complete enough that I felt comfortable sharing. So, my my pitch at the top of the hour is. Um, if you enjoy this kind of work and you'd like to support continuing to make this possible, um, the most direct way to help put money in my pocket, gas in my car tank, um, is to subscribe. Patreon.com slash PTPaleo is the best way to do that. Um, all of the articles that you'll be seeing 
um, including stuff that's in the backlog and the new stuff that's being released on a weekly basis. All of that is going into this project. It will all end up in Shadowbox at some point. Um, but Shadowbox itself will be free. So what you're looking at is going to be free software. Um, hopefully there's a demo um, that will be released. Uh, my, my, okay. My hope, fingers crossed, is that I can get this into people's hands by the end of this year. And if that doesn't work out, then certainly by April of next year is like my hard deadline. Just like figure it out any way you possibly can. Um, so before too long, um, people will be able to download this and play it for themselves and give me more direct feedback on how it runs and how it looks. Um, I've got a couple of, uh, this is kind of the area in the lobby here where I'm gonna be putting all the disclaimers. So that first thing here that I wanna point out is that this is going to be free. Um, you know, again, if you want to help support the project, you can go to Patreon. But I'm not going to charge for access for this game. There's never going to be a charge DLC um, or anything like that. So there's just a little disclaim here that says, if someone has charged you for access to this, uh, they're not, uh, money's not going into my pocket, and that's a problem. So please go ahead and report that to my Proton Mail. Um, not relevant yet, but I just want to point that out. Again, this is going to be a free project. Um, the other thing I'm going to point out is that absolutely nothing in here was made with artificial intelligence tools. Um, this is kind of a thing that everyone has had to come to terms with in the last couple of years, is that there are now new tools for creating what I would call just content slop, right? These tools that have been scraping information from the internet for years now that can make somewhat passable, you know, writing and imagery and stuff like that, but I believe it undermines our ability to do accurate research and to actually support artists in creating um, like actual art, you know? And so just to be clear, again, nothing that you're seeing here has been created with AI tools, none of the writing, I don't use AI in any respect. Um, no shade necessarily if you use these tools, but I do not, and that's not what we're looking at. Um, the question in the chat was, What's your favorite one that you found, uh, that being fossils in the field? I would say probably the coolest thing I've ever found was the femur of a, uh, of a Tyrannosaurid. So it's a relative of T-Rex, but about, we'll say, 15 million years younger. Um, it was uh, something in, I found in one of my field sites out in New Mexico, an area called the Menifee Formation. And you're going to get to see a little display of stuff in the Menifee Formation here as part of this tour. Um, that's a big part of kind of what my motivation was to build this is to give myself a platform to actually share these findings and these discoveries um, because the avenues you would expect me to be able to go through are much less uh, amicable to that than you would imagine I'll put it that way um, yeah so here's here's the uh, the spawn area where you begin the uh, two skulls that we're looking at here. This is uh, two copies of the same thing. This is a cave bear skull. All of the models, uh, that's another disclaimer I need to put on the wall over here. All of the models of fossils you're looking at are, um, they're based on real fossils. So none of these are, you know, made in Blender. I, again, I'm not a 3D artist. I don't have the ability to just create this, right? So this is a scan of a real cave bear skull. Um, that I have, have stuck little coins in the eyeballs and they rotate in different directions because I think that's fun. Um, a little bit of extra context here. These coins that you're seeing around here are uh, Moroccan francs. Um, Morocco, uh, for people who don't know, is one of the most like important areas in the world when it comes to fossils. One of the most prolific areas for yielding fossils in the world. And so I think it's kind of a cool callback to, to have something. And I also just kind of like the design um you know uh the design is really nice yeah there's um <laughs> this is a conversation i've had to i've i've had with a couple of people who are like what's what's with the pentagrams man <laughs> <laughs> um and and actually i i'd like to kind of talk a little bit about that because um obviously this is a symbol that has a particular meaning to particular people um in the context that i live in the united states but 
all across the world. Uh, you know, in Morocco, it's a very common motif. Um, it actually stands for the five pillars of Islam. In Christianity, it's also been used as a member, as a symbol of like the five sacrifices of Jesus and stuff like that. Um, in this context, I like using it to kind of invoke this concept of as above, so below, which is a phrase that you'll hear um, in, in a lot of different contexts. But here specifically refers to the idea that what happens on the Earth's surface today can also describe processes that happen in Earth's past. And the things that we see below the surface um, are, are linked to the things that we see happening above the surface. And this is kind of a key concept in paleontology um, our ticket to ride, so to speak, um, that allows us to make assumptions about what was happening in prehistoric time because we just assume um, stuff like atmospheric processes, like rain still worked the same way in the age of dinosaurs as it worked now. We assume that chemistry and physics hasn't changed since then. There's a principle called uniformitarianism. And essentially what I'm invoking here is that concept of uniformitarianism, as above, so below. So that's kind of where that symbol comes from. And then the glowing ammonite moon is kind of self-explanatory. It's there because I think it looks really cool. Uh, one of you guys can uh, uh, say something real quick while I, I do some ASMR and open my soda. Check this out. Right. Something real quick? Yeah. <laughs> Um, I personally really like the lobby. I think it's neat to go in and have the first thing be the cave bear skulls that you end up seeing. Kind of sets the tone for the whole thing. Yeah. And um, it is... Uh, I don't know. Some, sometimes it might have maybe been a little bit of surprise to some people, and I don't know why, that I kind of like a little bit of a morbid motif, considering that I'm a scholar of death. Like, <laughs> since I was a little kid, I have worked in and around like dead things, dead animals, and we think all the time about extinction. Um, and yeah, when you don't necessarily think about these concepts of mass extinction and mass die-offs, and even the idea that life itself could be extinguished, and that it almost has been um, multiple times in Earth's past, that's kind of a scary thing to contemplate. It was a lot for me to process as a little kid. Uh, that's why I'm so well-adjusted as an adult. <laughs> Um, but when you get through that, um, you kind of settle on this fact that, like, everything that has been alive on Earth dies. As far as we know, life is unique to Earth, this planet that we all share. Um, I'm not opposed to the idea that there could be life on other planets, but as far as we know, this is the only place. And everything we... Uh, this is just something that we share with everything that's ever been alive as we've lived on the same planet We've seen the same Sun and the same moon. We breathe the same air We drink the same water and we die and our remains uh, eventually go back into the earth and in extremely rare circumstances um, Those remains can be preserved for tens or even hundreds of millions of years to be found at some other time To give evidence that there was something that came before us so um, the, the tagline of Shadowbox is the mausoleum of natural history. This is not like a, a bright and friendly sort of kid type museum. This is kind of my place to show respect for the life that came beforehand and try to communicate as much of the information uh, that I've learned about the past over my life as I can. Uh, question, is there any particular significance with using cave bear skulls specifically? Yes, uh, this is the coolest thing that I could put in the lobby <laughs> at the time. <laughs> it's just kind of the most immediately like, oh my god, that is a that is a bear. That's, that's really cool. I so, think the lobby does a, a great job of tone setting. I yeah. think just even the lighting very does a very good job. Mm -hmm. And then you move forward into this little area. Um, and now I've got to explain this quote as well. Uh, the saying goes, show me your teeth and I will tell you who you are. Um, the, the quote that we're talking about here, George Cuvier, or George Cuvier, I don't know French, um, is this really foundational uh, French naturalist. If you go way back into the early classification of a lot of different living organisms, Cuvier is like behind a ton of it. Um, and so this quote here, which when you were talking about historic, like historical figures and quotes that they may or may not have said, bro, there's no way of knowing if you really said any of this. Um, 
it's not something that was in any of his books as far as I can tell. So like, yeah, maybe he said it, maybe he didn't, but I still like the quote because it has kind of two layers of meaning. Um, the way that he meant it literally, and here I'm showcasing a bunch of teeth and jaws, is that in biology and in paleontology, of course, you can tell a lot about an organism based off of the shape and size of its teeth, right? So uh, if we start on the left here, we've got the jaw of a little baby walrus. Next to it is a tooth of a mastodon. And by the way, um, obviously I'm taking suggestions for ways to improve this experience and, and to add features and whatnot. Um, there's going to be a laser pointer at some point so that like when I do little uh, demonstrations inside the game and I say, this is that, I don't have to like walk right in front of it, you know? <laughs> It'll just be like a little light that I can point to things. Um, just like when I used to do tours in in, uh, in actual physical museums, I always had a VR, not a VR, where I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, I always had a laser pointer that I could use to kind of show exactly what I was talking about. Um, back there is a little uh, woolly rhino tooth. This one is from a croc from just after the extinction of the dinosaurs. This really funky one with all the dots and uh, really cool texture is a lungfish tooth. Back there is a mammoth tooth. This one is from a capybara from Florida back in the Ice Age. This one right here is the lower jaw of a horned dinosaur called Zuniceratops. And that one up there is a sharp tooth from a uh, carnivorous dinosaur, Carcharodontosaurus. So, sorry, that's just an assemblage of all the different teeth I've got here. So you can tell a lot about um, what kind of diet an animal has um, just based off of the shape of the teeth alone. There's a lot of interesting research you can do um, to basically do chemical testing on fossilized teeth to tell what kind of stuff it was eating in life. So you can find a, a plant eater's tooth and say, okay, it eats plants, but was it eating grass or was it eating um, leaves? Was it eating fruit? You can actually do tests um, to chemically prove what its diet was. So there's a lot of science that you can do with teeth. But I like this quote because it also kind of invokes this idea that um, our true selves are kind of revealed by what we do under pressure and in conflict. You know, in, in a literal sense, show me your teeth and I will tell you who you are. Um, and I would not have expected when I sat at, when I set out to be a paleontologist as a little kid, right? Um, I, I honestly don't remember when I made this decision. It's just kind of always been what I wanted to do. And I would not have expected at that young age um, how much of a fight it would be, quite honestly, how many struggles would be necessary to kind of get from there to here and how much uh, work is left to do and how much I'm going to continue to need to grit my teeth and keep just kind of fighting through a really tough and difficult system. So it's a quote that kind of resonates with me and I thought it would be cool to kind of embed in the lobby here. And then we've got um, little lights here, this light fixture with a, uh, a chrome copy of those uh, cave bears holding a glowing orb. I thought that was fun. So Ooh, again, yeah, those are new. I hadn't seen those in previous iterations. Yeah, I've done uh, a lot of cleaning up in the last couple of weeks in preparation for this. So. And yeah, as it says in the corner, this is an alpha build. Um, so stuff is subject to change. Um, there's going to be a lot of blank walls in a lot of these. So you shouldn't take that as like, oh, he's just kind of throwing things around. They'll get filled in. Um, this is just kind of the earliest uh, iteration of the software I was comfortable sharing with people. Over here on this side, I've got kind of an example of what the different uh, galleries will look like. So again, here's that Mastodon tooth. You can walk all the way around this one. You can see the crown in front, move to the side, and that's the double root. Um, elephant relatives like Mastodon have this really interesting uh, kind of tooth replacement system. Um, they don't have that many teeth, actually. If you look in the mouth of an elephant, they've, some at some life stages, only have like four to six teeth, actually. There's just these big blocks that sit in the mouth. And instead of replacing them the kind of way that the rest of mammals do, uh, where we have the milk teeth that fall out and then our adult teeth that come in, and as those adult teeth wear down, 
you know, when you're done, you're done. You know, in the wild, if you wear your teeth down, you're kind of screwed. Um, elephants and elephant relatives, which believe it or not, actually include um, manatees have this kind of like conveyor belt replacement system where they've got all their teeth that start in the back of the jaw and they move forward in the mouth over time. So as those wear down, they kind of like move forward and fall out like a conveyor belt. It's super strange. Really cool stuff. Um, so we've got, we've got the model over here. Um, I see in the chat, my only thought is rotation. Um, my hope is that as I continue to develop the interactive element to this, that there will be places. I don't, not every single instance of a scan, you'll be able to just like rotate yourself, but certainly some of them, I want people to be able to kind of click and like press a button to kind of move it around so you can see it at all angles. That should not be that hard to implement. Um, and because I'm using Unreal Engine, which is used to do I mean, literally everything. You can make video games with it. Um, you can film movies in Unreal Engine. The limitation here is basically my own. It, it, it's basically like whatever we can figure out, me and my friends that I have helping me uh, code and design this stuff. That's the limitation. Um, so as I said earlier, in, in uh, PT Paleo, I've been producing these research uh, articles. The QR codes that you're going to see around are links that go directly to those articles so when you want more information you'll be able to just kind of hold your phone up to the screen and scan that and then it pops up uh, the patreon link um, the links will be unlocked so there's stuff on patreon that is still paywalled but i have a number of articles now that are freely available and this is i think one of them let me check that real quick you pull up your phone you open up the camera uh, hold it to the screen the link pops up uh, yep, that's a free article. So if you're at home putting your phone up to the screen, you'll be able to scan that and then pull up a page that has the same image, uh, the same imitated stuff, uh, sorry, annotated image, and then just a whole bunch of extra researched information with uh, references because it's really important that you cite where your information came from. Confirmed to work on my phone as well. Awesome. Who would have thought that citing where your source sources are is uh, important or anything in academia? <laughs> yeah, man. God, I cannot. Honestly, um, there was such a frustrating moment um, back when I first started actually writing research papers, where I was like, okay, well, traditional, you know, common sense is like, okay, Wikipedia is good for a summary, and then you can go to the sources and and read more. And I would kind of do a summary reading on Wikipedia and then go to the sources and try to find where that information came from and realize that actually it's like not in here. You know, like the 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 fact that they were trying to cite from that paper was not in that paper or I disagreed with the interpretation of the Wikipedia writer um, or what it said in the paper I interpreted as being like kind of different or even the opposite. So a lot of the reason why I've spent in the last two years producing over 167,000 words of text for the Parent Teacher Guide to Paleontology is that like, I just kind of don't trust <laughs> what's available on the internet to like teach myself. Like if I don't trust what Wikipedia says basically at all, um, how can I expect other people to like learn about paleontology and get true information if, if I don't agree with it? So, again, part of what people have been supporting me to do, and including people in this call, thank you so much, um, is just spending that time, like, pr like actually doing the reading, going to the real articles, and, and figuring out, like, what the actual information is. So, yeah, this is a little corner that just kind of shows an in-depth look at this mammoth molar, or mastodon molar. You can look at it in 3D. Whoa! Um, and then over time kind of in this area is where I'm going to be putting the specialty galleries. Um, what we're going to look at over here for the remainder of the stream are a bunch of galleries that are arranged uh, chronologically and by geological deposit. So that basically means I'm arranging these fossils in order from how old they are and grouping them by the places that they came from. Whereas on the other side, you'll be able to see galleries that are grouped more by like type or topic 
Um, I was teasing earlier, I've been working on a bonus blog about the paleontology of North Korea. There's actually a lot more about the fossil history of the Korean, uh, specifically the northern end of the Korean, Korean peninsula than you might expect. So that kind of stuff is going to go over there. Um, but as I said, these halls are arranged in order from time period. Some of these are technically epochs or epochs. But it starts all the way over here at the Ediacaran. Um, for those of us who went through like science education in the last 10 years or so, or earlier than that, um, the Ediacaran is generally what you would call the Precambrian. There's a lot of time that comes before the Ediacaran that's also the Precambrian. But um, the animals that we now know of as basically the earliest life that we know comes from the Ediacaran. Um, and all of these doors that you see that are labeled crypt sealed, that just means that I don't have exhibits built for those yet. My goal is that version one, the first full version of Shadowbox, will include one exhibit for each of these halls. So that's kind of the, uh, the goal here. Right now I've got one in the Devonian, one in the Carboniferous, one in the Permian, one that's open in the Triassic with a new one being built next year. I've got three that are open in the Cretaceous with two more that'll be open next year. And then one in the Eocene that opens next year. And then down here at the end of the hall, which I think we'll wrap on, is the Geological Eras Tour, which will kind of be a one-way walking tour, or really a two-way walking tour, of life on Earth. Uh, just kind of all of it in order. So um, let's go ahead and start over here at the Devonian, unless anyone has... Uh, something that they can say to stall for time so I can take a drink of water. <laughs> Consider stall. giving the stream a light. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Subscribe. Join <laughs> uh, Patreon at Paleo PT. Mm -hmm. PT Paleo. PT P A L E O. Uh, rate five stars. Uh, send this to your grandma. Or don't if, if, uh, she, <laughs> if she would have a problem with it. Uh, send it, send it to, uh, send it to anyone in your life who's interested in fossils and natural history. It's really stereotyped, honestly, that this is a kind of thing that only kids are into, but it's really not true in the slightest. I know so many people in their 20s and 30s and 40s who have kind of kept up interest in fossils and paleontology. But like I said, there's so few resources out there for people in that middle category. You know, they don't want kids stuff, but... They also don't necessarily have the tools in their toolbox to, like, break down, like, a scientific paper. You know, that's the kind of stuff that, um, like, you get trained to do that in college. And so unless you went to college specifically to do that, it's not necessarily accessible. So Shadowbox and PT Paleo and all that is kind of my attempt to build that bridge. Um, over here on the side, we've got scans of all these different fossils that are included in these subdivisions. Uh, chat says, that's an impressive and mighty task of all of Earth's fossil history. Oh, I know. <laughs> um, I just kind of had this thing where I like working really hard. <laughs> and um, honestly, if, if paleontology didn't give you that huge and that sweeping of a playground to play around in, so to speak, I don't think it would interest in me as much, you know? There's a reason that it's this is going to be a lifetime fixation for me, and is a lifetime fixation for a lot of people, is because there's so much to dig into. You know, even when I get sick and tired of one particular thing, just, just move five million years forward in time, and it's an entirely different thing, you know? So over here is kind of a taste of what we're going to be looking at in the Devonian. These are a bunch of coral. Um, this exhibit we're going to start off with, the Martin Formation, um, is about, uh, it's a little over 400 million years old. Um, we have a bunch of maps here on the side. Right now it's only showing modern North America. I'm going to replace these with um, paleogeographic maps that also show, like, so the, the modern maps I'm going to move into kind of the corner over here. Uh, oops. Pew. Sometimes I accidentally touch the teleporter. Um, I'm going to try to show both what the modern configuration of the continents looks like as well as um, what it looked like back at the time. So right now, this is just kind of showing... I, actually, I need to shift that over. That's like Kansas, but you get the idea, right? So that's the dig site that we're going to. 
Um, and again, this term that we're going to see a lot, uh, Martin formation, Menifee formation. A formation essentially is just a package of rock that was all laid down in the same place at roughly the same time. You know, this can be a localized area, it can be spread across uh, half of a continent or even a whole continent. Um, it can be deposited in only half a million years. Some formations stretch uh, 8 to 10 million years. It totally depends. So the Martin Formation is from a time period called the Frasnian Stage of the Devonian Period. So we're looking at the very late Devonian. Um, and the very first thing you're going to see here is Hexagonaria. Um, <laughs> I got to be honest, Nick, at, at when I was giving the demo... I just had to tell the story of when I um, put, I, I forget which version of this, but it was a few months ago, um, we were testing this, this out on your computer, and you hopped in here, and you're like, oh, hexagonorrhea. And I'm like, okay, so I've got to put pronunciation <laughs> guides <laughs> on each of these. Very important. Yeah. I'm pretty sure I would have made the exact same mistake. I'm pretty sure it's exactly how I started pronouncing that word in my head, to be honest. Yeah, it looks like it. <laughs> it kind of does. Um, and here's the thing. Here's what I gotta tell. So, th this is one of the things that you've gotta get over. If you get started in paleontology as a little kid, there's so much, like, obsession over saying the words right. And look, being able to pronounce the hard Latin words is important. But you've also got, at some point, to let go of the fact that there's, a, there's not a correct pronunciation of anything. Latin is a dead language. Nobody actually knows how any of these words were said. Um, we have modern uh, Latinized languages, obviously, so we can take a good guess. I speak one of those languages that has a lot of Latin influences. Um, scientific names also include a lot of Greek, uh, ancient Greek, and there's obviously modern Greek. So there's, like, more correct and less correct pronunciations, but... Technically, all of these pronunciation guides are basically just off of my own opinion, and I pronounce things based off of how cool I think they sound. I happen to think hexagonaria sounds cooler than hexagonaria. You could call it either thing if you really wanted to. Uh, but you know what? It's my museum. I say it's hexagonaria. So there you go. And then up here, um, this is the only room I've kind of put these in, so I'm kind of experimenting with this type of... Uh, uh, information display, but of course classification and breaking down um, which groups and subgroups these things go in. There's a lot of information to be shared there. So this is just kind of my way of showing um, these are animals. Um, people don't always think of coral as being an animal, but inside of each of these little ho uh, holes, whores, <laughs> inside of each of these holes <laughs> that you see um, would have been a small animal, a little polyp, um, you look up there, they're in the phylum Cnidaria. Cnidaria includes jellyfish, so coral and jellyfish, uh, which are both some of the most ancient animals that we know of, are fairly closely related, believe it or not. And then you break that down, and there's a bunch of smaller families and order, and then you get to the genus Hexagonaria. Um, in the Martin Formation, we don't necessarily know which species of Hexagonaria we have. So it's just generically labeled as Hexagonaria sp. So that just means it's a species of Hexagonaria. Um, and for those of you who may be from Michigan or the Great Lakes area or have familiar with that, um, there's a particular type of gemstone um, whose name is totally blanking right now. If I remember it, I'll bring it up. Um, it starts with a P. It's a particular gemstone that you find up there that is actually a polished um, Hexagonaria coral. Um, it's, it's something stones. Um, I should have that, I guess, written on the wall somewhere, right? Um, so anyway, here's, here's Hexagonaria. We've got a mix of the tiny, uh, tiny version. This is a little bit closer to life size. Um, and by the way, one of the things that I've gotten consistent feedback on and will, will definitely be addressed is that people want to know how big are these actually? Um, and they also want to be able to see the fossils in something closer to like actual like like a white light um each of these exhibits are are in a themed lighting so the devonian is kind of this orange brown because on the official geological um time scale uh the devonian is marked as being that kind of color but in each of these exhibits there will be a section yes that's the one uh, pasoki stones 
So if you've ever seen one of those or you have one of those, um, that is hexagon area. Congratulations, you have some in your pocket. Or you could call it hexagonaria if you really want to. I do. I really do. Um, so yeah, um, I'm getting I'm getting around to that. It's actually a more difficult. Uh, it, well, it, it's not difficult. I think to to understand that scale in a virtual space is kind of a hard thing to pull off because not everyone has a universal understanding of what the size of certain things are. Right. The suggestion is usually like, can you put a human for scale? And here's the thing, human beings, totally different sizes depending on who you are, right? Human for scale can mean a variety of different things. Um, I can include, and I will include, a literal, like, ruler that just shows, like, you know, here's what one meter or one centimeter looks like um, in comparison to it. But not everyone can, like, picture a two-scale ruler in their head, right? Um, and then. Loves Banana for scale. Yeah, yeah I was and about to say banana for scale. Right, banana for scale is the classic, but like, dog bananas banana? <laughs> are different sizes like are you, too. Are you using an actual banana? Or are you using one of those mini bananas? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and I mean, yeah, go to Costco. Go to the those. I mean, oh my god, like buck thirty giant bushels of bananas, so good. But like, yeah, they're gonna be totally different sizes. Um, and then, yeah, in, in each of these exhibits, there's going to be a mix of, of photography, of other things. Um, so Tiktaalik, which is what you're seeing here, um, is this famous... He, he's almost kind of slandered these days, actually, in pop culture as being the guy responsible for, like, modernity. You know, so Tiktaalik is um, very close to the ancestors of tetrapods. We can't say necessarily that it was the first four-legged animal, right? Tetrapods is anything that has four legs that includes you, monkeys, um, reptiles, dinosaurs, all tetrapods. Um, and Tiktaalik is kind of, uh, you know, there's all these cartoons of, like, the fish crawling out of water, and it's because of this bastard that I have to go to work in the morning, you know? Um, that's not the reason why you should blame capitalism instead. Leave Tiktaalik alone. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's, that's Tiktaalik. Um, this is a specimen I photographed while on vacation in Pennsylvania, which is really, really cool. Um, I'm hoping one day to be able to scan a bunch of the originals. Um, I, I, I actually, I, I don't know Neil Shubin, the guy who, uh, described these, but I know, uh, someone who works in his lab. And so I'm hoping that I'll be able to go in and scan those someday soon. Um, and by the way, Neil Shubin is aware of all your view jokes about how much you hate Tiktaalik for inventing modernity. <laughs> he thinks it's funny, but, uh, you know, leave Britney alone, so to speak. <laughs> so all of these are just different kind of chunks of coral that I collected in the Martin Formation. Um, something that I should point out is that this is a mixture in all of these exhibits. It's a mixture of um, stuff that I've scanned in public collections and stuff that's in private collections, which includes my own personal fossil collections. So while developing this, there's just this kind of crazy, like, because I remember finding these in the field, I remember picking these up, and now there's a 3D model of it in a museum that I built. And so in kind of a way, throughout the development of this project, I've, it's almost like I'm building my own mausoleum, like my own life and childhood is being like accessioned here. And it's just kind of an interesting um, I can't think of a of another way to say it besides mind fuck. It's kind of a mind fuck working on this, you know. Um, so this is another uh, coral. This is Thamnopora. Thamnopora is very common worldwide. Um, again, I'm just kind of amazed that photogrammetry was able to produce a a really passable 3D version of this because these are tiny. These are really really small, um, especially the little holes where all the actual uh, coral polyps lived. So here's some photographs to kind of demonstrate. Um, the coralites, that's the, the holes, and then the conostium is the space in between. Um, and again, part of the reason that I make all of these is that I don't remember that word off the top of my head. Um, I'm making my own notes so that I remember this stuff too, you know? That's kind of the purpose. So that's the Martin formation. I'm going to switch to my keyboard so I can run on out of here. <laughs> So not wasting too much time in transit. So that's the Martin Formation. That's the Devonian 
Um, it's like how? You, wait, wait. Can you demonstrate jumping around on one? Of the oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that's a that's a good thing to point out is that in physical museums and look, I volunteered in in museums. I've done internships. Um, one of the r things, one of the major factors that um, <laughs> people who design museums have to account for is the fact that kids want to jump and climb on everything. And so that's one of the cool things that I can lean into in Shadowbox is that like it, it will be built around being able to just kind of jump and climb all over stuff and get a better look. So if you want to see what does that look like from the top side, you can just kind of jump on it. I, I continue with the suggestion that you should absolutely put in little achievement markers to com to encourage the jumping. Yes. It would be very nice to yes. scratch the right collector urge yeah. to be able oh, to pick and, up all the little bits. And I think I have I think I mentioned the suggestion that I will be hiding small collectibles um, throughout the exhibits for you to pick up. Um, my okay. idea was to use, because I have got I got my wisdom teeth out several years ago, um, and I still have them, and so I was like, it would be awesome to scan like one of my own teeth <laughs> and add it as like a collectible item. And whenever I say that, it's like a 50-50 reaction between between people being like, that's awesome. And like, that's disgusting. Why would you do that? Um, which I mean, which tells me that I probably should. Yeah, I think you should <laughs> because it is technically like a piece of bone. So it fits yeah. perfectly with everything yeah. else in here. The only difference is it's not a fossil yet. <laughs> right. Well, and here's the thing, right? They're like, oh, that's so creepy. That's so weird to have human remains. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. If we're talking about ethical sourcing of human remains, surely the only ethical way to source human teeth is to take them out of your own face, right? <laughs> So now I'm jumping on um, these little composita. I you I will sometimes just colloquially call them clams. These are actually not clams. So they're bivalves. Uh, sorry, they're not bivalves either. Um, they're not they bivalves. they have two valves. They are a shelled organism with two valves, but that does not make them a true member of the clade bivalvia. Um, they are actually belonging to a different group called Brachiopoda. Brachiopods are still around today, but they were much more common in the Paleozoic, including in the Nako Formation. So we've moved forward in time from approximately 420 million years ago to about 309. That's how old the Martin, uh, sorry, the Nako Formation is. Uh, the Nako is one of these. Um, again, this this deposit is really important to me um, because. It's, uh, this is one of the most accessible fossil deposits in Arizona. I've been collecting here for a very long time. And um, I actually did my Eagle Scout project installing a sign at one of the um, publicly available... Um, uh, basically, there's a pull-off outside of Payson, Arizona. Ray was there. You remember this. Yeah, um, I our... actually still have my fossils from this particular um, formation under my bed somewhere. <laughs> oh, cool! So you can They're you can <laughs> you can pull them out and hold it up to uh, probably. They're almost certainly either Composita or Anthracospira for these are the most common ones that you find. Mm -hmm. um, Minecraft parkour. That's a good idea. Um, I actually my my frame of reference as far as like video games that I think have really good parkour systems is actually Dying Light, I think has the best one. So if I can replicate that as best I can, I will. But again, I'm just a paleontologist and not a programmer. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm not gonna promise anything that I can't, you know, I'll, I'll say I'll try, we'll put it that way. And yeah, Maybe again- A new game called Parkour Paleo. Yeah, and <laughs> it's, just, it's just a straight line. It's like a Subway Surfers ripoff. As you, you just run in a straight line. <laughs> And yeah, again, in, in a physical museum, you can't have this where you have a sign that's only visible from one direction. So I think that that's cool. Um, yeah. The reason I have it implemented that way, where it's visible from where you spawn in coming from the lobby, but it won't be in other directions, is because you'll be able to navigate Shadowbox in a nonlinear sense. So the Eras Tour will have different stops where you'll be able to jump from the Eras Tour into a specific exhibit if you want to learn more, and then back to the Eras Tour. Um, obviously in the lobby, it's arranged in chronological order. Um, and then in the specialty tours, like one of the, uh, one of the galleries that I'm going to make will be called the Arizona Trail, so that you can basically follow these different deposits specifically from Arizona through time. Most of what you're going to see today are from Arizona anyway, but as 
this project continues to, to grow, I'm hoping to be scanning lots more material, including stuff from much further away. Um, but because I'm at heart an Arizona boy, I was born and raised here, I still live here, and I'll be here for a while more. I know it's not going to be forever, but um, you know this is the place that I know the best. Um, and, and speaking of weird personal artifacts and like the interesting part of using like body parts for scale, so this is a fish tooth um, that you can find actually not necessarily a tooth, identical um, is, is actually a tooth-like scale that a lot of these early sharks have. So again, we're talking 309 million years ago. Um, life on land is only just starting around this time. Um, again, Tiktaalik, which was about 90 or so million years earlier, was one of the first animals to be coming up into the shallows and possibly onto the land. So by the time you're in the Pennsylvanian, the Nako Formation of 309, um, there are insects, there are reptiles, um, there are massive forests with trees, but um, not much more than that. There's not dinosaurs around yet. We're, we're still getting there, and there will be plenty of dinosaurs in a little bit. Um, I'm also going to point out myelina. These are one of my favorites that you find in the Nako. These are actual true bivalves um, in the family Bivalvia, and just looking at these fossils, I think it's pretty clear that like they just straight up look like mussels like that just looks like something that you could get on a on a dinner table you know <laughs> yeah yummy um this Can one over here i've eaten i've eaten some things that look like this <laughs> yeah hopefully not one of these because these are rock <laughs> crunchy crunchy <laughs> Um, yeah, and then I have this one in the corner. This guy is not uh, does not have a label yet, but this fossil is, again, one of my favorites. I picked this one up during a, um, what was that called? NYLT, the National Youth Leadership Training that we did as part of uh, the Venture uh, program. Again, Ray was there. She, she remembers yeah. uh, that particular camp. Yep. It was, oh, my God. It was kind of an ordeal for sure. Um, and... Uh, <laughs> One of the one of the there, there's parts of it that I could complain about and I won't for for sake of time, but um, one of the cool things was that the camp took place in an area that had lots of exposures of the Nako, and so I was running around in my free time collecting fossils, and so this is one that I picked up um, in that camp. Again, these are invertebrate fossils, so they're legal to collect with permission, of course, on private land. If we're talking about private land. Um, and so I was picking up these rocks and the, uh, because there was this kid who was in the cabin who was like really kind of violent and making like threats against people. And I was just trying to leave him alone and pick up fossils and just kind of get through the week or whatever. Um, the other, the other kids in my cabin were like, he's, he's collecting rocks so he can, and storing them under his bed so he can defend himself. It's like, no, that like, it's a fossil. <laughs> I don't. I hope I don't have to use rocks to defend myself I, here. But I could do that, but why would I? <laughs> right. I don't. Want, I don't want to get blood on my fossil. <laughs> Actually, speaking of, we will be showing a fossil later on. I almost got some blood on. I don't want to get ahead of myself. We're gonna jump forward a little bit to the Permian. The Permian is just one of the most fascinating periods of time in Earth's history. Um, a lot of people obviously know about the, the KPG extinction, this, uh, uh, we call it a bolide impact, this meteor that hits the Earth and kills off the dinosaurs. That happens in the Cretaceous down there, that green area. But well before then, at the end of the Permian, we have a much, much worse mass extinction event that kills off, um, uh, very nearly ends life itself on this planet. We're talking an estimated, like, upper 90-plus percent of all species die out at the end of the Permian. Um, and, you know, there's, there's this kind of phenomenon uh, here in Arizona. I don't know about everywhere else. Um, you read this book in high school called The Jungle, which is this important historical book that talks about um, the meatpacking industry here in the United States and all of these really gross health code violations. Um, Upton Sinclair was a labor organizer, and his whole point was like, you know, this is just one example of a number of abusive industries in the United States. We need to band together for labor rights so that we can prevent this stuff. But his book, because it described a whole bunch of just really gross stuff happening in meatpacking industry, like meatpacking plants, the the end impact was like the creation of the USDA, 
to regulate food safety and like didn't do much to help um uh like like workers rights necessarily so upton sinclair's line was i aimed for the public's heart but i hit him in the stomach and my my insane correlation between that and the permian extinction is <laughs> um, that a lot of people know the the end cretaceous experience uh, it, the end cretaceous uh, mass extinction and are really particularly worried about it um, and are like what you know what's going to happen if another meteor comes and and strikes the earth but the kind of freak accident really that happened 66 million years ago that caused that extinction is extremely cosmically rare and there's really nothing that we can do about it to stop it at this point right um if such a thing were to happen again we can launch nukes at an asteroid i guess to try to knock it off course i think that's probably the best use i can think of for nuclear weapons um, but at the end of the day what happened in the cretaceous was just one of these facts of life right um there's no reason to believe that you know there's there's no guarantee of safety right this is nature this is the real world and sometimes stuff like that happens and there's catastrophic consequences the extinction that happened in the permian on the other hand was mainly caused by the emission of carbon dioxide because back in the pennsylvanian so think back to the naco that we were just in a little while ago um there was this huge accumulation of coal and all of these plants. Um, and because it took a long time for things to evolve that could break down trees, believe it or not, we had this massive store of carbon. That's why that period is called the Carboniferous. And in the Permian, there was a massive, um, uh, this trend of volcanic eruptions happening, particularly in Siberia, because all of the continents were coming together and forming Pangaea. That's why over there we've got the phrase the sands of Pangaea so at this point in time all of Earth's continents have once again um, kind of collided into one landmass and it's causing all of these um, uh, volcanic eruptions and those volcanoes are bursting up through these massive underground coal seams and burning fossil fuels and putting them into the atmosphere so that may or may not sound familiar um, and the end result was um, massive massive warming of the global climate acidification of the oceans and uh, total almost complete extinction of life on the planet massive ecological collapse all of these different things so the weird thing about talking about extinction in the fossil record is that people are really obsessed with the end cretaceous extinction which is extremely unlikely to ever happen that way again right um, it's like people being obsessed with the meat packing industry because of, of this particular constellation of, of occurrences that allowed, you know, rats and human, human remains to get ground up into hot dogs, right? <laughs> um, but what people should really be concerned about is the end Permian extinction, because it was much worse, and because it's, it's happening again, right? We're doing this on purpose and not realizing that there's historical precedent for exactly what happens when we burn fossil fuels. Now, it's part of why paleontology is important. It's not just about, you know, looking at cool fossils, right? This is how we learn what happens um, when, when there are certain phenomena like that on the planet. Anyway, welcome to the Coconino Sandstone. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, let's dive right in. <laughs> welcome to the Coconino Sandstone. This is an end Permian um, age deposit in northern Arizona. So again, these are tracks that I picked up when I was around 10 or 11 years old. Um, there's a, a lovely uh, couple who have a quarry up there, Harley and Debbie Gray, um, awesome people who have uh, a big sandstone quarry, Drakestone. I'm just giving them a free shout out. I don't even care because um, they're, they're just awesome people. Um, if you're trying to buy slate for, for your backyard or whatever, Drakestone. <laughs> um, and, and they uh, let me come on their property and collect a bunch of, of footprints. So what we're looking at here... Um, these indentations are footprints of an animal called called calicnus. So when you classify fossils based off of traces, you call them ichnotaxa, and that basically just means it's a species defined by behavior and not by physical remains. So we don't actually know what calicnus looked like. We don't know if calicnus was made by one species or multiple species. Um, 
until, you know, body fossils are found in the Coconino sandstone, which seems fairly unlikely at this point. The, this deposit's been explored for, uh, I think, about 100 years now. Uh, probably not going to find it. And by the way, if you've ever visited the Grand Canyon, the Coconino sandstone is one of the major deposits that make up the cliffs of the Grand Canyon. So again, well, there's a lot to do with the history of Arizona um, in this pro program, primarily just because that's where I'm from. Uh, one cool thing I'm going to point out here, so we've got the this little footprint here. You can see a couple of the toes, hopefully. I, I think you can see them. Um, I'm trying to be open to feedback as far as like improving the lighting on these because it's really like subtle in some ways. Um, I see them. Okay. I'm looking on my stream and I can see it. Excuse me, I can see it too. Um, one cool thing I'm going to point out is that until I took a 3D scan... Oh, I haven't answered one of the important questions in here. I do like potatoes. I like potatoes in a variety of forms. <laughs> Just thought I should answer that one. That was important. Um, I think I've met someone who doesn't like potatoes. Uh, I'm sure someone has an allergy somehow. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, it wasn't until I took a 3D scan of these tracks that I noticed. So I knew about you know these two over here, these two up there. It wasn't until I took the scan and I loaded the, the, uh, the model into Unreal Engine and started putting lights on it, that there's actually a much bigger track in the middle there. So there's, um, there's kind of a spotlight on it there. There's, there's one, two, three, four, five little scratches up there that mark a bigger track. Um, and potentially, you know, so we can see that those two sets, obviously made by different individuals, we would classify them both as colicness because we don't, again, know. Um, we don't know anything about them other than the size of their feet, basically. Um, so they're both classified as colicness, but they could be different species. They're obviously animals of two different sizes, but they're heading in the same direction. Um, and based off of my interpretation of this fossil, um, I believe that the smaller footprints were laid down first and that the big track, which is heading in the same direction, was laid down second. And I interpret that as being, again, this is in ichnology, you kind of make up stories, there's no way to prove a lot of this stuff, but just an, a possible interpretation is that this could be a larger predator um, that is pursuing a smaller prey. They're not running, we can tell that by the way, that you know, the shape of the footprints, but this could potentially be a big animal that is following in the tracks of a smaller one potentially to pursue it as prey. So that's just one way that you can interpret this block. Um, paleontology is all about telling stories. Um, and then, of course, you have to be honest about how much of it you can actually prove scientifically. Otherwise, you're just telling stories, right? So we've got another track here. You can see some more scratches over there. This one is actually not Kilichnus. This is a different species that I haven't uh, profiled yet. But this is from an insect of some variety, an arthropod for sure. It might, it might be a scorpion. Um, I have to go back into my notes and do some research. But, I mean, again, I'm really just so excited by the fact that I can make models of, of such a subtle feature. On the real thing, um, we're talking about like a millimeter upraised, you know, or, or something like that from the flat surface of the rest of this. And like it shows up. You can see those tracks. Um, so even if this original piece is sadly destroyed someday, which does happen to fossils, unfortunately, there's always going to be this digital copy, right? Um, yeah, so there's, there's a lot, obviously, in this room that I'm still working on. Um, I do want to point out that if you're an artist, um, I do want to be able to support people who do paleo art, paleogeographical art, all this kind of interpretation. Um, and so I'm looking for basically people who are willing to um, basically uh, do a commission system where we're going to, I'm going to pay you, probably not a lot, again, because I don't make a whole lot of money, um, and I'm not selling this product, so we're not making up revenue on the, on the end here, but I want to pay you a little bit of money, put some money in your pocket because artists deserve it. Um, to produce a work that you're going to retain the intellectual property rights on. You want to make merch, you want to sell prints, go ahead. Um, but we'll be putting a copy of it on display here. Um, and you can see, just by looking at these images, again, these are photographs that I've been making and annotating um, in Photoshop. The quality here is high enough that, like, 
it's going to be a really good um, quality display of your work. And in, ju in much the same way that, you know, my Patreon mark is in the corner of a lot of these, my QR codes to my Patreon pages are in there, I'm going to give you guys the same opportunity. So if you'd be willing to kind of work under that system, you know, I'm going to put a little bit of money in your pocket to make something that we can put on display. You'll be able to put links to your stuff, uh, QR codes, I'm totally fine with all of that. Um, and again, this is going to be a free platform. So, you know, uh, when I look at other kinds of places that artists have to use in order to get their work out there, um, they're kind of miserable, right? You've got Twitter was a really big one for a long time that is now se severely, uh, you know, uh, I mean, it's not even called Twitter anymore. It's barely recognizable. It was intolerable to start with, and now it's even worse. So if you're one of these people who is relying on Twitter to kind of show off your work, you know, there's not a lot of platforms that are available that aren't full of Nazis, right? Um, Tumblr is kind of coming back, um, so you can still obviously use Tumblr, but not everyone's on Tumblr, you know, and Tumblr's not a, a free museum. So I'm really interested in putting stuff like this in context and giving people the chance um, in much the same way that I, I've built this program so that I have a platform to share my work. I want to be able to connect with other people and uh, have you guys share your work too. So after that end Permian extinction, which almost kills everything off on the planet, um, life survives and life persists. And that's also part of the story. You know, it's not all just this gothic melancholy. Um, life survives. And then we get to the Triassic. And the Triassic is where the reptiles really start doing weird stuff. Um, this is where uh, the land animals are getting bigger and bigger. Um, this room is still pretty basic. The Chin Li is actually um, this massive, massive formation with tons of incredible material that I just haven't gotten around to scan yet. Again, a lot of these are just things that I've collected over time um, in particular places. I should also point out, by the way, that... Um, you know, a big part of why I'm going to make this program free is because I, I genuinely believe that natural history is part of our shared heritage, right? We are all people of the planet. Um, all of these animals that we share, animals and plants and stuff, all from the same area. And so we have a connection to everything that you're seeing here. We might not be closely genetically related, but these things lived in Arizona in this case, in the Triassic, we're talking about, we're now closer to 209 million years ago, 204-ish. Um, you know, these are things that lived in the same place as me 200 million years ago, you know? So there's a connection that I share with these fossils, and there's a connection that everybody shares with their own natural history um, in their region and in the world. So that's part of the reason why I want to make this freely available. But I also want to point out that it's not just my philosophy that points to this in a literal sense in the United States, um, fossils that are found on uh, federal land, public land, public property, BLM managed land, um, is all quite literally public property. And part of my privilege as a paleontologist is being able to work with fossils on public lands. Um, but that doesn't mean that I own it, and that doesn't mean that any particular person owns it or has the right to restrict your access to it. You know, it just means that um, there's, there's not many people who are qualified to safely handle these materials and work with them in a scientific manner. So again, I'm lucky in that I get to work with the real things, but I believe that everyone should be able to get up close and personal with this stuff and be able to look at it um, in, a, in a manner that is both educational for you and safe for the fossil. So just keep in mind that, um, again, if you're more familiar with the kind of academic publishing regime, any fossil that's published on in, um, any fossil that's published on in the scientific literature has to be in a public collection. So theoretically, the scope of what, um, is possible to accession, take scans of and put in this museum is anything that you see in the scientific literature. Anytime you see a news story about this new fossil has been found in blah, 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 and it's kept in this museum, all of those things, technically, guys, that's fair game. So just keep that in mind. That's part of what I'm so excited about, the fact that, you know, this stuff works, that I can 
actually take scans and, and build this program that looks really good is that uh, there's a lot further that I can push this. Um, somebody stall for time while I take a drink. <laughs> stalling, stalling for time. Doing the thing called stalling for time. <laughs> yes. I always forget that Discord has a um, has that sound board. board. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> With the ability to add in your own custom noises. Yeah. Oh yeah, I do. I've got some terrible <laughs> ones. Here. I've got some yeah. terrible ones. Don't. Uh, I'm not. I'm not going to use them. Um, yeah. So in, in this area, again, this is the Triassic. This is around the time that the very first dinosaurs are appearing on Earth, although so I just fell down. Um, by the way, another advantage to virtual spaces is that you can fall <laughs> and not hurt yourself. <laughs> um, oh, and, and I forgot to, to mention this too in uh, my live demo, but obviously part of the advantage of building things this way is for physical accessibility. There are a lot of people who, you know, have... Uh, you know, motor and mobility uh, restrictions, that means that spending hours and hours walking through museums or even getting to museums if you live in a rural area um, is just kind of a difficult thing. And so making a free software like this is hopefully making it more accessible to people who have those kinds of uh, mobility challenges. So part of the feedback that I'm trying to solicit here is um, you know if if you're aware of any kind of accessibility features that I can implement into this program to make it so that as many people as possible can access this software, um, please let me know. Um, I should oh. probably put the email, uh, uh, but it's ptpaleo at proton dot me. I'll put it in the chat somewhere. I Nick, have a what, live suggestion, maybe. What's that? I don't know if this would be something that people would report on, but. Uh, at least maybe going to like the University of Arizona like newspaper publications they'd probably be doing willing to do like a alumni highlight for like a, a new kind of virtual product that uh, someone made yeah so like maybe you could advertise to like University of Arizona students god I would hope so again if I <laughs> if I get back and and it looks like I will be um, hopefully returning to U of A for a master's program at the very least um, yeah, last time I, I was there and I, I got out a publication. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I got out a publication as an undergrad, but because U of A doesn't have a paleontology program and I was doing all of this basically, you know, on w what you might call extracurricular work, um, there wasn't really any, like, I didn't, I, I didn't have the chance to use any of my school's platform either. So yeah, uh, this time I'm 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 not gonna make that mistake. I'm gonna be like, hey, I I made a thing. I'm a I'm a master's student. This isn't for my masters, but like, I made a thing. <laughs> so we'll see. Um, I'm not gonna. I I, I would like to to get to because um, we've got about yeah 53 minutes and I want to make sure to get to at least a little bit of everything Miss August was just woken up by me knocking on my table sorry about that um, she's such a scaredy cat and anytime someone like comes to the house she always runs away so she's looking at me like what have you done I've always been too noisy so she never likes to come around when I'm around I'm too loud the, for her the <laughs> last time you came here was when she went so far into my under sink cabinet that she she went <laughs> You remember this? She went into the oh, far no. corner with the boiler and got stuck. Yes, oh no! And you were you? I think you. I think you were returning. You were giving me your house key so I could watch your cat or something like that. But yes. then I had to. I had to cut the landlord. My landlord. Don't listen to this. Tune out right now. I had to. I had to cut like the the cabinet. The, the countertop off and like move it so I could get my cat out. <laughs> so that's all duct taped closed. She can't do that anymore. Anyway, this is Van Clevia. Van Clevia is not a dinosaur. It's this really cool fanged reptile. Um, and eh, why not? I'll tell the story. Um, th this particular specimen uh, and, and the photography that I did of this specimen several years ago is, again, part of the reason why I was inspired to start 
um, PT Paleo and actually start not only annotating my my work and my photography, but also put my my name and 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 uh, attribution credits on it because I took this picture and I uploaded it. I shared it to Twitter and I was like, I'm a nobody. I don't need to put my own like word attributions on it. And it's not that great of a photo anyway. Who cares? And then, uh, so Fossil Friday, hashtag Fossil Friday is this uh, social media thing that paleontologists do. It's like an excuse to post a random fossil on a Friday. It's a good outreach thing, yada, yada, yada. One day I log on on Fossil Friday and I see someone who is a professor and very well known in the field of paleontology, I'll say, has posted my photo of Van Clevia, and I know it's mine because I've got the ex- I've, I've, it's the exact same one. I had it resting on a paper towel, and he posted one with the same thing and the same orientation on a paper towel. That's my photo. And he posted it without attribution. And so I was like, wow, I've made it. Someone is stealing my work and passing it off as their own. That's awesome. But that also means I need to start uh, putting my image credits on there. So anyway, that's why. Um, Yay, I'm being plagiarized. Yeah, exactly. Um, Okay, so quickly looking at stuff in the Triassic. um, Metoposaurs, which is what we're looking at in this corner, are not reptiles. They're actually really big amphibians. So this huge, and and these are actually quite big. This thing is hefty and sits... And sits in the palm, like, it, it's bigger than the palm of my hand, this thing that we're looking at. This is part of the skull table. Um, and uh, you can look at this same piece in cross-section here, and you can see all of those little holes, right? So those are blood vessels that run, and part of the marrow that runs through the bone. And one of the key things that you look for, um, if you're trying to determine if something is a fossil or a rock is to look at cross-sectional texture and to, to see if you can find that kind of spongy texture on the inside. So one of the things that I'm excited to help people with is kind of determining, you know, at home, you can help kind of learn what a fossil looks like as opposed to a rock because any kind of forum on the internet uh, where people discuss fossils, there are literally hundreds of posts every single week of people posting basically their their driveway gravel and asking if it's is this a dinosaur tooth is this a dinosaur brain i found a dinosaur brain is this a heart um and so doing a little bit of uh kind of helping people see the difference just kind of visualize is part of what i'm excited about and speaking of blood vessels this is another piece and you can see a bunch of little holes um there's a big hole and then a little hole in the center and you can kind of see a streak running towards the top um and those are Kind of blood vessels that are coming out of uh, onto the top surface. So that's all really cool. I, lo- I love these guys. And um, as time goes on and I start scanning more material, I'll be able to show you more of what a metoposaur looks like. Phytosaurs are croc-like reptiles. They're not dinosaurs. They're not even crocs either. They do have some armor, and so these are pieces of phytosaur armor. This is a coprolite that I found... Um, in a Triassic deposit, coprolite is fossilized feces, so it looks like a turd because it's a turd. Um, thanks for coming. We got someone in the chat who's taken off, but I really appreciate you sticking around. You'll be able to uh, watch the rest of it if you're interested. It'll be accessioned um, on the YouTube channel. But thanks for coming by and uh, chatting with us. Um, and then one last thing to show, if we're talking about the Triassic, especially in Arizona, we got to talk about petrified wood. So here, the petrified forest in the Painted Desert is super famous for having tons of petrified wood, giant logs and things. So here's just a tiny example of petrified wood. Uh, there will definitely be more as I continue to develop this. And then, of course, um, the Triassic is one of my favorite things to make exhibits in because... Its official color in the geological time scale is this like purplish pink. So it just, it kind of looks like a nightclub, you know, in that room. So the Chinle is late Triassic. I have an early Triassic exhibit that'll be coming in 2025. Look forward to that. Um, So with the Triassic, we've officially entered the age of dinosaurs. The Jurassic is when stuff gets really cool and really big. I don't have any exhibits in the Jurassic yet. But I do have stuff in the Cretaceous. And the Cretaceous is very, very famous for having lots of big reptiles. Um, here's just a smattering of a few of them. There are crocs. This is a giant dinosaur tooth. 
Um, that's a shrimp right there, believe it or not. At the corner, we got some turtle shell. So now we're in the Cretaceous, and there's not a ton of Cretaceous in Arizona itself. The first place we're going to be going to, the Turney Ranch Formation, which is about 100 to 110 million years ago, a million years old. Uh, this is in Arizona, pretty close to where I live, actually. Um, and then two of the, the exhibits we're going to end on, the Moreno Hill and the Menifee, are both in New Mexico. But let's start with the Turney Ranch. Going in here. Uh, thank you, Ellie, for the comment. I also frankly agree. I'm really excited by how cool it looks. Um, this is kind of an experimental, like, force perspective annotation of uh, this particular fossil. So this is, you're looking at actually Arizona State Dinosaur Sonorosaurus. Um, when I got some feedback on the demo a couple of days ago, someone who researches Sonorosaurus let me know that um, that transverse process is actually a caudal rib. Okay, fair enough. Um, uh, I'll use I'll use that to point out, however, that again one of the advantages of um, a a virtual museum is that if you make a mistake like that, oops, that's not a transverse process, that's a caudal rib. Um, if it's already in the exhibit, you've got to go back and like print out a whole new insert, or like you know if it's wood or some other thing, like go and drill that whole thing over again uh, to correct that little piece, all, I, all I'm going to need to do is go into Photoshop, type out the word caudal rib, load it into Unreal, replace, dr you drag and drop, and then it's done, right? So updating exhibitry for, to correct for errors, but then also to accommodate for new research is just way easier in a format like this. So that's one of the things that I'm definitely going to flex. Um, anyway, this is a tail vertebra. This is one of the bones in the tail of uh, Sonorosaurus, and Sonorosaurus is our state dinosaur here in Arizona. Um, it's a long-necked dinosaur, so picture something like uh, the Brachiosaurus in Jurassic Park. Um, it is probably closely related to that, although it's younger. So Brachiosaurus by this time, 110 million years ago, is already extinct, but Sonorosaurus could potentially be um, somewhat related to it. So again, this is one of the scans that I like uh, making huge so you can kind of walk around it and really see. Um, and this one is not jump onable, but this totally is. So I took that one tail vertebra and I duplicated it and stacked it. So this is kind of what the tail would have looked like. And if you've ever really wanted to run along the back of a dinosaur, uh, that is absolutely uh, something that you can do in Shadowbox. You can get your Flood Flintstone moment. Just kind of running up and down. <laughs> Parkour! Oh, I missed. Let me try again. <laughs> okay, now we're on top. Alright. Uh, we've got one of the toe bones of Sonorosaurus sitting on the floor over there. And then on that wall is, uh, again with my hand for scale, is um, one of the toe claws of Sonorosaurus. And on that one is a 3D scan that, instead of making the whole thing 3D, I've just made the fossil 3D. So it kind of sticks out the side there. So that's really cool. That's so cool looking. So again, I'm kind of experimenting with different ways to, um, to, d to do all these kinds of displays. If there are particular ways that you like, that you like better than others, definitely let me know. I think the force perspective thing on the side, because it looks so silly once you're not in the... <laughs> force perspective probably not going to do it this way again uh, probably going to do something else for this one but you know again it's all experimentation this is an alpha leave me alone uh, <laughs> one more thing i'll point out on sonorosaurus is that in addition to the bones of uh this rare i should point out um early cretaceous sauropods from arizona extremely rare um, this may actually be the only one we know of so far and in addition to those fossils, we also found, I say we, this excavation happened like two or three years before I was even born. So this is the general we, the royal we, whatever you want to say. Um, when paleontologists were excavating Sonorosaurus, this tooth was also found. It's not in very good condition at all. Um, it's, it's got some serrations on the side. Those lines there are part of what gives it the, uh, the sharp edge that would have allowed it to cut through meat. 
Um, but there is one tooth, and this is of a big predatory dinosaur. Um, elsewhere in the country, at this period of time, we know of an animal called Acrocanthosaurus. It's this big, big carnivore that has a little bit of a sail back on it. Not as extreme as Spinosaurus, but still really big. Um, this thing over here, this is actually not Acrocanthosaurus. This is my illustration of Carcharodontosaurus. Somewhat closely related, I'll replace it with an Acrocanthosaurus when I do an illustration. I should point out, this is a drawing that I did. I'm not an artist, but like, I tried. <laughs> I think it still looks pretty pretty passable. Yes, it, it does indeed look good. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. I love the sarcastic golf clap. Don't ever use the <laughs> the, the um <laughs> the um the cricket chirp that Discord has is just so it's so me. <laughs> I, I love that one. I'm trying to be funny. Yeah, the crickets are funny. Yeah. Anyway, so this is um oh have I pointed out? By the way, I'm gonna run in circles for a second. You guys hear the uh, the foot the footsteps? I want to turn it on. Yeah. Okay, so oh. that's that's something that I just added. Um, that I sh I say I um, my partner Brayton Brandis, who is currently at work earning money at the food bank of Southern Arizona, hero. Um, is also helping me uh, with all the programming and things, and so I recorded the audio here. This is actually me. Those are my footprints walking around in the lobby of Gould Simpson, which is the geosciences building at U of A. Oh, shit. I've been there with you. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I was just there nice. a couple weeks ago, and I was like, okay, I need some, I need some walking MP3s on, like, a marble or otherwise, like, that type of uh, flooring. So I'm just gonna kind of walk around in the empty lobby of this building for a few minutes. <laughs> Impressive. Good so choice. anyone who was, uh, you know, watching the security cam footage in Gould Simpson and very confused, that's what I was doing. Leave me alone. Um, <laughs> okay, so now we're gonna move forward to the Moreno Hill Formation. This is another really rare interval of time and we're really lucky to have these fossils in the Southwest. Um, the Moreno Hill Formation was laid down in the Turonian, so now we're at about 92 million years ago. And the Turonian is a time when sea levels in uh, all over the world, actually, are extremely high, right? There's no permanent ice anywhere on the planet, North Pole or South Pole. So there's just a lot of water uh, free-flowing in the ocean. And actually, um, a lot of people are aware that water molecules kind of expand when they're heated and shrink a little bit when they're cooled. And then obviously you have your phase change, it's less dense when it's solid, whatever. Um, but when we're talking about a global hothouse, uh, an environment where there's no ice and all the water is free flowing in the ocean, hot water is takes up more volume than cold water. So sea levels are high because there's no ice and because there's it's just a global hothouse, there's hot water everywhere, the oceans are warm. So that's, that's I, when I was taking my climate classes, I thought that was just nuts. That like, it, it actually works on a big enough scale that like global warming causes ocean rise, not just by melting, but also by water taking up more volume. So that's, that's, the, crazy. that's the kind of uh, world that we're looking at here in the Turonia. And these fossils all come from Northwestern New Mexico, 92 million years ago. And there are only two places in the world that preserve um, uh, dinosaur fossils of this quality from this interval of time. This are, these are some of the only fossils of this age that we have anywhere. Um, and in the Moreno Hill Formation, thanks to extensive, extensive work um, on behalf of the Wolf family, so I always want to give uh, props to these guys. Um, the, the names here, Christopher and Hazel, are both named after members of the Wolf family who committed tons and tons of time and, and money and talents to uncovering these extremely rare fossils that all of us now get to uh, to learn from. And these represent four different dinosaurs. So we have the horned dinosaur Zuniceratops, this totally bizarre um, bipedal herbivorous dinosaur called Nothronychus with these huge claws, um, Heawati, the hadrosaur, hadrosauroid technically, with this, uh, this jaw that would have been packed full of teeth. And then we have our predator, Suski Tyrannus, which is um, 
on the lineage that leads towards T-Rex. Um, again, this is 92 million years ago. The first T-Rex shows up maybe about 70 million years ago. Um, so this is a much smaller, um, potentially ancestral species. So uh, that's kind of the assemblage. And again, there's a lot of work to be done in this particular room, but I'm really excited to show this off because there's just so much material I've gotten to scan over the summer. Here's kind of a rough piecing together of parts of Zuniceratops. You've got the hips and the, the femur and the tail. This is the shoulder blade, and then these are elements of the skull. The maxilla, uh, which is the upper jaw, the mandible, the lower jaw, and then one of the horns. Again, the final thing is going to look a lot different. <laughs> um, we've got some of these other pieces. I'm going to switch to the keyboard here. So we've got part of that upper jaw bone. This is another kind of uh, viewing mode that I'm trying out where you have a big 3D scan in the front um, showing the same orientation and then uh, behind it slightly are things in uh, the same thing mirrored but smaller looking the other direction and then you have the annotated image behind so you can kind of like you know when you're doing online shopping and you're uh, uh, going back and forth between the computer screen and your credit card, you're like, okay, huh, uh, 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 okay, yeah. So we've got this upper jaw. Again, it's got, you can see all the teeth sticking out the bottom there. And then these uh, accessory dental foramina, which are all these holes that are sticking out of the top here. Uh, so that's the upper jaw. This is one of the lower jaws. And there's my hand for scale once again. Um, these animals have beaks. That's one of the coolest things about the horned dinosaurs. Uh, this is the lineage that, again, um, might not directly lead to Triceratops, but it's the same family, the same clade, I should say. Um, and Triceratops and Zuniceratops both have a beak on the front. Um, I'm definitely looking forward to scanning the beak and, and attaching it in the front. Um, we also have a brain case of Zuniceratops. So you're looking at the brain case from the back so that that big ball that you're looking at in the front there is called the occipital condyle and so that's the that's that's basically what attaches to the first vertebra the uh what's called the atlas of your neck so there's literally a ball and socket joint the same way that in the in your hip you've got a ball and socket joint um in vertebrates I, most if not all of them don't quote me on that there's always exceptions but on this um, this ball right there is basically what gives you a, a wide range of motion in the neck. And Zuniceratops has that one as well. And then, um, wow. yeah, the brain is kind of inside this area. You can actually kind of get under and kind of look around. So we've got the brain case. And then this one over here is a juvenile horn core. This is probably um, the most famous and probably the most sentimentally important uh, fossil for the wolf family from uh, from this area. This is one that Chris picked up as a, as a little, little kid, and that's why Zuniceratops is named Zuniceratops Christophori. Um, so the eyeball would have been just below the horn right there. This is just a little baby. Again, there will be um, more realistic scales, right? The horn core and the brain case are, are not similarly sized. So in each of these exhibits will be a space that lets you see them uh, in true light and in true size. But for now, um, it's kind of like breakfast cereal. I have them uh, enlarged to show texture, is what <laughs> they all say. Um, Heawadi is not known from a whole lot. This is the hadrosaur. Approximately looks like this. Again, this is kind of the extent of my illustration skills. I can make a little silhouette, and that's about it. Um, so yeah, this is a lower jaw. This is the lower right mandible. So... This is the inside view, and you can see all these little uh, channels. Those are where uh, the teeth would have been packed in. So when we talk about our herbivorous dinosaurs like Zuniceratops and Heawadi, we talk about them having tooth batteries, which just means that they have rows and rows of teeth that are packed into the jaw, just like a shark, um, because they wear down pretty quickly over time. The vegetation in the Cretaceous, we're talking about like cycads, not a whole lot of soft material. Um, flowers are just starting to show up. Flowers and fruit are just starting to show up around this time. Um, actually, flowers probably go back to the Jurassic, but 
um, angiosperms, that, that group, are not prolific. They're really rare until around this time in the Cretaceous. So around this time and then moving forward, we're just starting to see animals that are adapted for um, eating fruit and flowers and things like that. Heiwadi and Zuniceratops have the old school um, jaw battery that is designed for chewing through really tough material. So that's kind of approximately the size of Heiwadi. And then um, these, these, this is the group that are commonly called duck-billed dinosaurs. Um, I don't particularly like that moniker, but it's something that people are familiar with. And so in the front here, you see just kind of the tip of the bottom right part of that beak. It's got kind of the little holes there. Um, so you have the toothless portion of the jaw, the diastema, and then you have uh, where the beak would have been, right up front. So there's Heiwadi. Let's go see the theropods, the, carni the carnivores, and um, <laughs> the stuff that's probably not carnivorous, actually. So Suski Tyrannus, again, this is the snout, the very front of the face of Suski. So the tip right there, the snoot, you could boop it right there. Um, you can see the teeth on both sides, pieces of the top and lower jaw. And there's an image that shows if you're really interested in the fine anatomy of all the little pieces. Um, so this is a lot smaller than T-Rex. It's a lot smaller than T-Rex. Um, this thing fits in the palm of my hand. I've actually got a 3D print of it on my desk. Fits in the palm of my hand. Um, I guess I should point out all of these scans like that I've made. Like a cat or a rabbit? Um, so like it, the full thing? The full thing, so because dinosaurs are like long, um, they've got, yeah. they're like 50% tail. Right. Excuse me, as part okay. of like a counterbalance. Um, mm -hmm. By like mass, we're talking about something that's probably around the weight of like a, a decent sized dog, but it would have been a lot longer than that. Mm -hmm. Um maybe at, at this guy's size maybe six feet or something like that i can go back to the oh, to the okay. paper and and see what their and estimate and is in the palm of your hand or is that just like a, a no so the, the this fossil this fossil sits in the palm of my hand i should specify i know i know that's what yeah. i'm trying to is, get, envision the missing part of the head i guess mm -hmm. is the this fossil that... sorry go ahead yeah. Uh, is this fossil like from a juvenile or is it from a full grown adult? Yes. So this is from um, a juvenile that would have been about two years old. Um, okay. And this was determined by actually, you can tell the age of, of reptiles by cutting open the femur. I think people are generally aware of this. You can cut open some of the bones and then count rings the same way you can count tree rings. Um, okay. And so uh, the, the femur was sawn open. Actually, I have the femur of Suski. One of them is over here, the right femur. So just imagine putting this under a saw and cutting a tiny slice into it that you can put under a microscope and count the rings. Um, there's, there's two specimens of Suski Tyrannus known, um, and I think both of them were determined to be around two years old. So again, or, or in that case, between their second and third birthday, because... Um, you have, you, if you have two rings that are laid down, that means you've gone through two, uh, uh, two growth periods, and those growth periods are approximately annual. So you're between your second and third year. Um, that's how that's determined. Um, so yeah, it, not only is this animal a lot smaller than a full-grown T-Rex, this is also a juvenile. So it should always be taken with a grain of salt, you know, kind of how big Suski was. But we only have two specimens of it, and they're both juveniles. Um, so here's, here's another kind of example of one of the display styles that I'm experimenting with. This one has a, a, the trunk vertebra basically means it's from uh, the back part of the animal as opposed to the neck or the tail. So here's what it looks like as a flat image, and here's what it looks like three-dimensionally. So in this case, uh, this just makes it a lot easier to see, like, which part am I actually pointing to when I say the posterior articular surface, and which part is the centrum, which part's the anterior articular surface, and the neural canal and all that stuff. So um, with the exception of just kind of the paneling being a little, <laughs> I need to work on that on the sides, but like, this I really like. I think this kind of model I'm going to be using a lot more of. 
wonder if there's any way to <clears throat> instead of having the like uh, lines be like flat images, to have them be three dimensional like tubes. Oh yeah, there definitely is. Um, there's just a lot about uh, modeling in Unreal Engine I need to learn. You're gonna see sure. some of my very earliest modeling attempts in the final exhibit here, uh, which we're gonna get to quite quickly. Um, yeah, so we've got an ankle, we got the tibia, let's just say tibia, and the femur. Over here is Nothronychus, which is this bizarre uh, theropod dinosaur. There's a little illustration and an outline of what it would have looked like. And then this, this drawing I think I did a really good job on. I did take several days to do it, so it better look good. <laughs> yeah, it does. Um, this is the... Um. This is what the arm of Nothronychus looks like. So Nothronychus means sloth claw, um, and it's a therizinosaur dinosaur. So the therizinosaurs are one of the strangest uh, groups that we know of um, in that they're theropods, so they're related to and they come out of the same clade that includes T. rex and velociraptor and birds, but instead of being predatory or um, capable of flight, this thing could not have flown, just putting that out there. Um, <laughs> They, they're probably herbivorous, and they have this huge gut and this huge hip. So this bone right here is, is really historically significant. This is a left ischium. Um, the ischium is part of the back part of the hip. Um, so this is the butt bone that basically kind of holds the ass end of the animal together. And when this was originally found, this bone was thought to be part of the frill of Zuniceratops. So the horned dinosaurs have these long frills. Um, and this was thought to be part of the frill. And that was a pretty reasonable guess because therizinosaurs were not known from North America. They had only been found in Asia. Um, but it was determined after finding this piece and then some claws started showing up. So these are some of the toe claws and toe bones of Nothronychus. These certainly are not from Zuniceratops. Um, and they also don't look anything like the other uh, theropods we would expect to be in the Moreno Hill. Um, it was put together that actually that's the hip of a therizinosaur, and then more pieces of it were found, including this dorsal vertebra. This is two copies of the same thing. Um, so again, I have upcoming uh, articles that will show kind of more integrated labels, but um, these are related to the line that comes to birds, and so they're very, um, the word we use is highly pneumatized. It means that there's air sacs in these bones. So uh, the fossils of Nothronychus are are quite delicate and it was really really um i mean everything in this exhibit is really scientifically significant but it was awesome to have so much of this animal skeleton because this was the first therizinosaur ever found in north america and to this date there's only one other therizinosaur that's been found called falcarius falcarius okay so that's the Moreno Hill. We're going to end in this part, um, and then we'll go for a walk in the Eras Tour and listen to the music that I made with Nick. Uh, we're going to go to Yay. the Menifee. The Menifee, if you know me at all, is a big part of my life as a paleontologist. I'm out there making videos um, at least once a year, if not twice a year. This year I'm going out again in October. Um, and again, if you want to support this project and also get a ton of other goodies, the best way to do that is to sign up for Patreon, patreon.com slash ptpaleo. If you go to the expedition donor tier, you're going to get two things. The first one is you're going to get to see in process development of Shadowbox. So if you want to keep seeing, um, uh, if you want to be able to get on a Discord call with me while I work on Shadowbox and talk with me about it and give suggestions, um, people in that $12 and up monthly tier, it's just 12 bucks a month, um, are not only gonna get the chance to hang out on a call with me, and if you don't make it, if you don't have the time, if it's at a time that doesn't work for you, you'll still get to see clips from those streams and stuff like that. Um, but expedition donors also get to see um, videos live from the field, live as live as I can get them, basically. So I record myself doing digs, um, and then that same day I edit and upload them to YouTube, but they go to Patreon first and they're exclusive to Patreon for the first three months. So if you want to see me out in the field in October, um, out in the Menifee Formation looking for fossils and be able to see what I saw the same day, um, that $12 and up tier expedition donors, that's what you get. Um, so I think it's a pretty good deal. Um, anyway, 
Everything you see in this gallery, in the front area here, these are all petrified tree stumps. So um, if you go onto my channel, you can see all of the expedition videos that I shot earlier this year. Um, one of the things that you didn't see me do, because I was using my phone for other things, was take 3D scans of these in situ petrified trees. So all of these that you see are trees that uh, have not been collected and probably cannot and should not be collected because they are sitting out in the field in the exact same position that they were when they were growing 80 million years ago. So the Menifee is about 80 million years old. This one over here, again, this is my first attempt at doing some, some modeling. So this is an approximation of the slope that it was on. It looks like bubble gum. I'm going to add a better texture later. Don't worry about it. Um, but these are trees that um, every year when we go out into these areas, I walk by them. Um, I see them. They, particularly this one over here, has a nickname. It's called Stump on a Hump. If you get close okay. enough, you can see uh, some of the lichen that grows on the surface of Stump on a Hump. Wow. Um, this Ooh. guy has been, has been falling apart over time. Uh, this root ball that's sticking out on the side here. Uh, is smaller than it used to be. There's a big chunk of it that's lying on the ground now. Um, and so ultimately, you know, there's, a, as I've talked about, a lot of reasons why I'm doing this project, a lot of reasons why I think virtual museums are important. Um, but someday, Stump on a Hump will completely fall apart. It'll probably take a few decades, um, but someday it will not be in intact anymore. It will not be in situ. And I'm going to be really glad that in 2024, I took the time to get a full three-dimensional uh, scan of what it looked like so that at least that information is preserved. Um, and how old did you say that it was? 80 million years. So it's been around for 80 million years and now it's having like the final stages. Of yeah. This so it, apart. That's crazy. It, it grew, it was buried, um, and then there's erosion. So all the rock that it was buried under has eroded away. You can see that it's sitting on top of this pedestal that is slowly being excavated underneath it. The fossil itself yeah. is a lot tougher than the soft mudstone it's sitting on top of. So the mudstone slowly whittles away. And um, yeah, it's in its final stages. After 80 million years of, of growing, dying, being buried, being uncovered, and now it's exposed and falling apart. Um, so some of them are are sticking up out of the ground. These are some other uh, trees, little pieces of them. And then this one is a log that is, hold on, boop. This one is a log that is sitting on the ground. So this in this one, I just kind of walked around it in a circle. So this texture you're seeing on there, all these little rocks and things, that's what it actually looks like. This is what the floor of the Menifee Formation looks like, which is pretty cool. And then you have the tree in the middle there. Um, and then, yeah, in this room, uh, again, the Menifee Formation is this place that I've spent a lot of time on. I have a publication already published from a few years ago. I have another one that I'm actively working on. Um, this QR code right here goes to another free article that has all kinds of information about it. So pause the video, scan this uh, with your phone, and go read about that if you're interested. Um, I have to get to my Crocs, right? So here's Dinosuchus. Yay! Um, these are bones from the, uh, from the back of this animal. So this is a gigantic relative of the alligators. Um, and all, uh, hold on, let me think. Yeah, all, all crocodilomorphs. And crocodilomorph basically just means um, crocs and croc-shaped animals. There's a lot of things that look like crocs that aren't. Um, but all of them have armor that sits in the skin. Um, it helps with not just protection, but also thermoregulation. Um, and uh, this is what they looked like when we collected them in the field in 2018. I mentioned, I think I mentioned earlier, there would be a little bit of blood. So uh, when we collected those that day was the first time ever that I had a nosebleed. Um, but the nice thing about having a nosebleed while collecting fossils is that you're already surrounded by toilet paper, right? We pick up the fossils, we wrap them in TP and then stick them in Ziploc bags or in this case, tinfoil. So I, I was collecting fossils and just my nose started bleeding. I just stuffed the TP in my nose and went about my day. Got a little bit on my thumb though. 
So the uh, discovery of these fossils provided a really important opportunity for me because these were the first ones of Dinosuchus that had been found in the Menifee. Um, Dinosuchus fossils are known from all across North America, as actually <coughs> on the East Coast too. Uh, they're in Delaware, they're in uh, Alabama, they're in Georgia, they're in Texas, and then here in New Mexico. Um, and so finding these fossils gave me the opportunity to describe the first fossils of Dinosuchus from the Menifee and discuss their implications in the distribution of this animal. So another important part of building this is giving myself a platform to share my scientific research. So if you scan this code, it goes to not my Patreon website, but to a, a scientific journal called PeerJ, which is an open access journal. Um, unfortunately, in science, there's a lot of paywalls, right? But the, uh, the open access movement has allowed for research to be publicly available in ways it never was before. So if you scan this, you'll be able to go and see my original uh, uh, peer-reviewed scientific paper describing the first material of Dinosuchus. And then um, if you think that's cool, uh, keep in mind that, again, as time goes on, I'm going to be building more expansive exhibitry um, to help explain more of, of my research and things like that. There is more to be said about the crocs in the Menifee. Um, and so there's another paper I'm working on right now. Once that's out, I will be adding a whole new section to this exhibit on not just one additional, but two additional species of crocs from the Menifee. So that's all upcoming, um, that's all upcoming research. Um, and I just think it's really cool that I'll be able to, moving forward, um, share my research uh, with people in this way, right? I go out into the field, I take videos, I scan the fossils, I put them in this museum. Um, I think that's a really cool workflow. There are dinosaurs in the Menifee. Uh, it's gonna take probably several more years before I can actually show scans of all of those, so look forward to that. Turtles are really common in the Menifee Formation. Here's just a couple of them. Um, the genus Adocus and then the, the genus Trionyx. Um, I know from working with uh, turtle people out in the Menifee, Dr. Smith and uh, Brent Adrian, that uh, Trionyx is eh, taxonomically unstable. It's probably going to be a different genus someday, but for now it's called Trionyx. Um, and these are soft shell turtles. So the same kind of thing that you see in Florida today, the soft shells were also around in the Cretaceous, living with the crocs and the dinosaurs. Um, and turtle fossils are actually the most common thing that we find in the Menifee Formation. Most common reptiles, I should say. Um, petrified wood is probably more common. So in here, I'm going to be adding all kinds of scans of petrified wood. Uh, we also find uh, invertebrates. This is another bivalve. It feels like forever ago that we were looking at myelina back in the Naco. Um, that, that was quite literally 129 million years <laughs> earlier. Wow. But there's another bivalve, uh, Unionid. We'll be learning more about that later. Um, by which I mean a couple of years, probably. Um, there's, there's just so much more work to be done. Again, everything you've seen today is the result of over a year's worth of work just in Unreal Engine to produce all of these exhibits you've seen. Um, there will be more. This will all be available for free. Um, the demo will be out. Hopefully before too long, my, my aim is December, and if December doesn't work, then certainly no later than April. And we're going to finish off by taking a stroll down the Geological Eras tour here in the last 13 minutes. I think that's appropriate for making a Taylor Swift joke. We'll give 13 minutes the Eras tour. Um, okay. Yeah, so this is still very much a work in progress, but this is my way of kind of linearly arranging um, the fossils in order. So you can kind of walk from here. The most recent, the Holocene Epoch, began 0 0.012 million years ago. And then this whole hallway is actually to scale. So as we walk forward, you'll see in the corner, um, it'll show exactly how far back in time you are. So here we're at, oh, let's see if I can get it, 1 million years ago exactly. And then you get to modern times. So that's a million years. We were just talking about traveling 120 million years or so. So we're going to take that walk. We're going to play. Here's the spinning vinyl disc. Um, in, in, in this whole process, and actually one of the first things we worked on was music. 
um, because obviously this is going to need ambient sound and all that stuff. So Nick has been helping me. Um, uh, we, we had, we had these amazing uh, piano sessions here in, in my apartment. <laughs> um, and while like, Developing music is just another thing that I didn't have any experience starting out with, and I'm learning. Um, and someday there's going to be all kinds of tracks coming out of that, and we're going to keep working on this stuff. We're going to keep jamming. Um, th- this part is so is so so cool. Um, but I can unveil the the name of that project will be um, Paleofi the Fossil Record. Um, the <laughs> the accumulation of all that music will be called Paleofi the Fossil Record. I think that's really fun. And I'm going to go ahead and play um, as we start walking. And I'm so sorry if this music is like mixed way too loud <laughs> through the uh, through the YouTube stream. Oh, yeah. I don't I, I don't know. Yeah, I'm going to unmute, unmute the, the stream. YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, this is a track. I think this is called Untitled 2. Um, I can reveal that its name will be Mammoth Americanum, which is the scientific name of the Mastodon. So the American Mastodon, that fossil we started out today with almost two hours ago, looking at that little molar, um, this is named after that animal. So let's take a listen and take a stroll. So here we are, the Pleistocene, moving forward. So in that time, just moving that little space, we've already exited and entered and exited the Ice Age. It's already over. Then we move back into the Miocene. This is an early cat. Weird horned rodent. There's Megalodon. Some rhinos. Elephants. Or you don't. Fossilized fish. This is an early whale tooth. And we're already at the 50 million year mark. We traveled 50 million years. We've got a ways to go. This is one of the large mammals that evolved just after the extinction. When we cross over from this yellow to the green, we will hit the end Cretaceous extinction that killed off the dinosaurs. So standing right here, all the non-avian dinosaurs are gone, and here they live. So we're going to start seeing some of those non-avian dinosaurs. That's a T-Rex tooth. Everyone say hi to Velociraptor. There's Dinosuchus again. And our friends in the Moreno Hill. Again, there's going to be plenty of things added to this in the future. We gotta run to the Jurassic. Look at how far we have to go just to enter the Jurassic. Here we are. Some big carnivorous dinosaurs. Apatosaurus, one of these long necked guys. Here's a Megalosaurus. This was the very first dinosaur fossil ever scientifically described. Kind of. <laughs> Asterisk. Some pine cones.
My little illustration of Cryolophosaurus. This is a dinosaur from Antarctica. Here we get to the Triassic. And we're just gonna bolt to the Permian. By around here, this is when the first dinosaurs appear. And right around here is that mass extinction that nearly ended life on Earth as we know it. And you can just kind of boop, 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 boop. There's our footprints in the Coconino sandstone. Do not start putting foot emojis in the chat. <laughs> Here's a funky early reptile, Catylorhynchus. Some amphibians. We're in the Carboniferous now. There's Composita, Myelina, Anthracospirifer. Now we're in the Devonian. Our corals, Thamnopora, Hexagonaria, there's Tiktaalik. An early armored fish. Zanaspis. We gotta sprint a little more. Now we've got back to the trilobites. And the track has ended, so you guys can uh, come back on the chat. Please come back, I'm so lonely. <laughs> Hello. Hi, welcome. Well, since you asked so nicely. Yeah. <laughs> and my hiccups don't go away. <laughs> so we're gonna I think go... the song is really nice. It fits well with, with the... Yeah, and I used, um, I used some samples. One of the samples that I used are, like, elephant calls. And there's, like... Um, some splashing and stuff like that. So I figured I figured um, Mammoth Americanum, American Mastodon would be a good a good name for that. So we're gonna jump all the way to the end. Oh one second. Hold on. Sorry, I One second. I am unlocking the door. No. Oh. There you go. Hi. Is, just is, caught the tail end. Oh. Is August doing things again? No, I forgot to undo the deadbolt on the front door. <laughs> <laughs> so Brayton just got home. Say everybody say hello. 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 They said hello. Um, we did. Yeah. So as we wrap up here, I'm not going to kill the stream right at 5 p.m., but that's you've seen just about everything. Um, the question in the chat... Uh, Beautiful work, thank you. Amazing that everything here is done within a year. Approximately how many hours per week do you dedicate to this project? I have no idea. <laughs> um, a lot. I I it's don't. A lot. I it's it's probably a lot. Um, I think if I actually sat down and tracked 
exactly how much time I spent on it, it would probably make me very depressed. <laughs> um, so I, I I have not tracked. It's been a it's been a ton of work, and not just from me, but from from Brayden and from Nick. Uh, we've had some friend from another Gabriel, uh, another Gabriel, another friend named Gabriel, um, <laughs> and a bunch of play testers, uh, Rita, um, uh, and back here we've got one of my bone monstrosities that I've hidden. So just one oh, yeah. one last little lesson. Um, this thing you're looking at right here is called Ediacaria. We are now at. 545 million years ago, we've come a long way since we started, and uh, this guy is kind of what the earliest life on Earth that we know of, the earliest animals, would have looked like. This is a jellyfish, basically. And then um, the further back you go, you just start getting into um, single-celled organisms, you get into stuff called cyanobacteria, um, you know, things that basically the fossils in the Ediacaran um, are so difficult to study that a lot of the times the, the question becomes like, am I really looking at a fossil or is this just a chemical stain on a rock, right? So this is basically the old one of the oldest definitive fossils that you're looking at right there, Ediacaria. Hard to believe jellyfish are that old. Yeah, they're, they're one, of the, one of the first animals, the Cnidarians, are one of the very first. And then behind it is one of my little bone monstrosities, so I just kind of can't help myself in that, um, I mean, if I'm going to go through the trouble of building all this educational stuff, and I've got all these bone scans just sitting around, I'm also going to make some, uh, some creepy stuff. So this is just some kind of weird creepy thing I've stuck here at the end as a, uh, a little congratulations for people who made it. Um... So there we go. That's the end of the arrows tour. I'm gonna run back to the. Actually, I don't need to. I can just. It definitely needs to be an achievement when you get to that guy. Oh, absolutely. Play. All right, and we're gonna drop back in the. I don't know why it dropped us here, but there you go. So now we're back in the lobby. So that is Shadowbox, the mausoleum of natural history. That is what it looks like so far. Um, um. Ooh. Thank you. I'm super grateful for everyone who has helped contribute to this project. Um, thanks for watching. Um, again, I really want to make sure that this program is as accessible as it can be. So if you have feedback on any kind of accessibility things, um, please let me know. If you're interested in potentially being commissioned to do art for this, I'm going to take a second and put that email in the chat. It is ptpaleo at proton dot me shoot me a message um, as well as if you have general questions um, if you'd like to support me and the project again everything that I do on patre patreon dot com slash pt paleo and that includes um, the research notes the Q and A's um, the live streams the videos all of it is stuff that is eventually going to be put on display for free in this museum. The museum itself will be free. I want to get a demo into people's hands as fast as possible, but, um, you know, this is running on a, a pretty powerful computer that I'm live streaming on right now. Uh, the screen is actually uh, rendering in 4K, um, and not everyone has hardware that can quite do that. We've been playtesting this on a bunch of other computers, and most of them do not run it this well. So I'm trying to at least make it playable, right, on as many hardware um, configurations as I can before doing the demo. But part of the demo process will be um, getting technical feedback and then working on that as I can. Um, hopefully, fingers crossed, I will be starting a, a master's program at U of A um, in fall of 2025. So I've got some time to continue working on this. And I don't see any reason why I won't be... Um, Continuing to do this through graduate school again, um, a lot of, a lot of uh, the advisor. If if I'm going with the person that we're thinking of right now, um, everyone's always been super supportive of my kind of independent work. So I don't see any reason why um, you won't be able to keep getting updates on this into the foreseeable future. But definitely for the next year, 
Um, this is what I'm going to be working on and continuing to build. So um, that's going to be the end of the public preview. Um, again, if you'd like to see weekly in progress streams, I do those right now on Wednesdays from 4 to 5 p.m. Arizona time. Um, so if you're an expedition donor, you'll get to uh, jump in on those calls. If that time doesn't work for you, you'll still get to uh, chat with me and answer questions. I'm comfortable arranging alternate times um, if that stuff doesn't work for you. But again, uh, yeah, thanks for thanks for watching. Uh, please sign up if you're interested. I really, I really can and do use all of that support that I can get, um, and this is what I can do with it. So hopefully, that's I. I think that's the best uh, pitch that I can give. Hooray! Ta-da! Thank you! <laughs> Yay! Awesome pitch. Everything looks amazing. Uh -huh. <laughs> cool. Okay, so I am going to 